the big ones. We have good security for some women. I'm so glad those of you were there. Yeah. Um, I haven't had anyone in particular pass me any notices, but I do know that after church today there's the Bible study on Friday, so if you'd like to come in and join in for that, that'd be great. Yeah. Let's open our service in the Word of Prayer. Dear Lord God, we thank you that we have the freedom to come and worship you today. Help us to put all other thoughts aside and focus on celebrating who you are on all you have done for us as we get all together in your life. Amen. And I just wanted to share a psalm with you as I often do when I worship lead. So Psalm 28 verse 7. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and I am held. My heart leaps for joy and I will give thanks. To him in song. So I invite you all to join me and Georgia and our worship team as we bring our praise to our Lord in song this morning. We're going to start with You Are My God.
to our time of communion and all who wish to join us are welcome to join us in communion today. So, have you ever been given a present? Yes, yes. I'm sure most people have. <laughs> have you ever been given a present that has been a really great value? Yes. Um, might not necessarily be monetary, but it might be something of great value to you. Have you ever received one of those? Mm. How have you felt when you've received that present? Really yeah. And how have you reacted to that present? Overwhelmed and great. Yep. Yep. So when you receive a present of great value, you don't necessarily just go, oh yeah, that's good. Let's move on. Do you? Yet often we can have that sort of reaction when we consider the great present that we've been given in Jesus Christ and what he did in giving up his life for us. We can be blinded to the real meaning of what we are um, about to share in with communion. We can get caught up in so many other things and so many other thoughts and when it's been described sometimes as the mill that divides because the way in which the churches have put all these other rules around it and have squabbled over what's really important about it some would say the bread and the wine has to be real bread, real wine and nothing else will do. But that's really important about what we're doing here. We have crackers. For some people that's not really acceptable. <coughs> some say that you should share in this once a week. Others say every time you meet. Yet others will say, oh, we'll only reserve it for special occasions. What's right? Is it important? Whatever way we share in this meal, we're all sharing it ultimately for the same reason. <coughs> Jesus instructed us to share in this meal in remembrance of him and what he did for us. And that's a gift of great value. A gift that's not worthy of a response of, oh, well, let's just move on and um, get on with our life. It's a gift that really warrants a response, a response of gratitude, as you would when you get a valuable gift. I'd just like to read a passage from Luke chapter 22. <coughs> it really sums up what this is all about. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it? they asked. He replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters, and say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them, so they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat again until it finds fulfilment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this cup, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. He also took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
in the same way after, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. <coughs> Jesus is the Passover lamb. It's a great gift. He's given us his gift, he offers his gift to each of us, and he offers it again today to each of us as we come to share in this meal. What a great gift we have. What a fantastic gift that he has given us, that our sin may be forgiven so that we may have life and life eternally. Let's just take a moment to individually reflect on that gift. Reflect on what Jesus has done on that cross for you so that your sins may be forgiven and the life that is given. And let's give thanks to God. Dear God, thank you for this bread. This bread that represents to us Jesus' body broken on the cross for us, given freely for us so that we might live. The Lord Jesus on the night was betrayed to a bread. And we had given thanks before I kept the set. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And now just give you the bread. You can take it and eat it in your own time. Let's give thanks for the wine. Dear Lord God, we thank you for this wine. This wine that reminds us of Jesus' blood spilled for us, given up freely so that we might have the life that he gave up. We thank you that you put this in place so that we'll never be drawn back to you. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this is the cup, <coughs> this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. We can just hold the cup and we'll share together as a symbol of unity in Christ amongst us all being distributed.
Savior, Jesus Christ. take up uh, the offerings. Um, if you've already been online uh, visiting or have not come prepared, please feel free to let the uh, bags pass you on. Let's continue worship in prayer. As we draw near to God, He promises to draw near to us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge the wonderful fame of being invited to draw near to You. Although we are unworthy on our own to draw near to You, Jesus has made us worthy. And boy, are we thankful. We worship you for who you are. You are holy. You are righteous. You are good. You are forgiving. You are loving. You are merciful. You are matchless. We worship you as the wonderful counsellor, our wonderful counsellor. 
the Prince of Peace, our Prince of Peace, the Saviour, our Saviour, Almighty God, King of Kings, Everlasting Father, our Loving Father. We adore you as the one who is eternal, unchanging, present in all places, perfect in your knowledge of all things. We adore you as the one who is unsearchable in wisdom, sovereign Lord of all, irresistible in power. We adore you as the one who is full of purity and righteousness, always just in your government, always true, inexhaustibly good, so good to us, infinitely greater than our best praises. Heavenly Father, we give you the glory in all this. Your Holy Spirit has loved us and entered our heart, imparting eternal life in us. You are love. We bless and praise you for your love so unmerited and grace so unspeakable. We thank you for your grace, the blessings we receive but don't deserve, and for your mercy not receiving the punishment we do deserve. Forgiving Father, forgive us for our sins of pride, rebellion, disobedience, selfishness, hatred and idolatry, the things we raise up in our life that we put before you. Forgive us. Lord, forgive us for being half-hearted towards you. Forgive us if we have disrespected your name or treated you irreverently. Lord, forgive us for any sins we have committed. You can pray silently for a few moments. Holy Spirit, remind us of all those we need to forgive and help us to be quick to forgive. As for each of us, Holy Spirit, bring to remembrance those we need to forgive. Let's take a moment and ask the Holy Spirit to show you names or faces of people that you might need to forgive. And as he shows you, say quietly, I forgive so and so. When you get home, say it out loud to show yourself you're serious. We'll pause as we seek the Lord to bring us in tune with him as we forgive others. trust and faith in you to heal any wounds in our soul caused by our unforgiveness. We thank you in faith as our great healer. We thank you for the forgiving us. Holy Spirit, help us all not to yield to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. We thank you that you know what we need as your church here at Melunga. Father, we continue to wait on you as you supply all that we need. We ask that you raise up people to do what you want done here, or bring the people or person to do that. 
Our hope is in you as Lord our God. You keep every promise forever. We stand amazed at how awesome you are. As humans, we're not doing so well. We really need your help. Women have been killed here in our country at alarming rates. We'd love it if you'd step in and stop it. But you've given us choices, and many don't make good choices. So Lord, we ask that you would cause governments to make laws that will deter such behaviour and protect women and children. Lord, please touch the hearts of those who do not adore you and help them, especially our loved ones, to love you with all their heart, soul and strength. Help us to be a thankful congregation who reflect your glory by the way we live our lives. Holy Spirit, help us to always be mindful of your presence in our daily lives and help us to be quick to respond when you quicken us to action. Lord God Almighty, you reign. Great and marvellous are your works. Just and true are your ways. We love you, we honour you, we glorify your name. You alone are holy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Before we have the Bible reading for today and head into the sermon that Mum has prepared for us, let's ask God to open our eyes and help us focus on Him. Uh, 
why do doubts raise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you can see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet, and while they still did not believe, it was because of joy and amazement. He asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They, asked, uh, they gave him a piece of broiled fish. He took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance for forgiveness of sins who were preached in his name to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses to these things. I was just going to say good morning everybody and I got beaten. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to thank Brett and Kevin uh, for your message and for your prayers. I, after listening to you both I thought I don't need to get up here. They, they've done it for me but, but thank you. It was wonderful. My message this morning is based on that last line that Peter read for us, um, witnesses of these things. And I just wanted to read verses 46 and 48 again. Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. A lot of people ask the question, what's the point of the resurrection? Why did Jesus die and rise again? And it's a pretty important question, isn't it? And sometimes it's not an easy one to answer as we might think. But in this Gospel reading today, we do get an answer. This is our third and final week of looking at the resurrection stories in the Gospels. Last week, the reading was from John 20, and that was when Jesus came to the disciples in the locked room, but Thomas wasn't there, and Thomas doubted that Jesus was alive and we all know that Jesus came to Thomas and said here are my hands, here are my feet. But today we're looking at the resurrection from Luke's Gospel and in both cases in the reading from John and in Luke today Jesus comes to his disciples after being raised from the dead and he offers them his peace. And I thought, that's wonderful, isn't it? The first thing he said was, peace be with you. But he also offers them proof that he's raised from the dead, not just spiritually, but physically, because he showed them his hands and his feet. But then today in Luke's reading, Jesus does something else that is quite 
extraordinary. And we read in verses 44 and 45, he opens the minds of his disciples to understand the scriptures. He helps them to understand the point of it all, why he died, why he rose again, and what happens next. But then he also uttered a very important sentence, and it's really one of the most important sentences in the Gospel of Luke. A lot of people say it's like the John 3, 16 verse, but it's in Luke. And I just wanted to read what he said. Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. So what is he actually saying in this very important sentence? There's three points that I want us to look at this morning. And the first point is, the Messiah, who was Jesus, is to suffer and to rise from the dead. And that's the first thing Jesus says, that the Messiah had to suffer and to rise from the dead. There was no other way. And of course, in fact, it is the very, it's the very core of our faith. Jesus died, but he rose again. And that's what our faith is based on. And everything else that we know about Jesus leads to that central point that Jesus died for our sins, but he rose again. And we do believe that, I'm, I'm hoping and praying this morning, that you do all believe that Jesus is the Messiah and we do believe that he suffered and died for us. And finally, we do believe that he rose from the dead. Because all of that is so important. It's even crucial in our faith. If Jesus isn't the Messiah, then his death was in vain. If he didn't die, our sins are not forgiven. And if he wasn't raised from the dead, then our hope of eternal life is worthless. But then we also noted that Jesus, he rose spiritually, but he also rose physically. And that is why when he went to see his disciples, he asked them to touch him. And then he asked them for that something to eat because he was hungry and they gave him the broiled fish and he ate it in their presence <coughs> and that was to show them that not only was he raised spiritually he was raised physically and you know one day we too we're going to be raised up too one day whether we are dead or we <coughs> Jesus comes again, which we're all waiting for, we are going to be raised up with God and Jesus for eternity. Somebody wrote, think of that, that your body already contains in it the seed of eternity. And I didn't think about that, but when we believe in Jesus, we're already carrying that small seed of eternity in our hearts because that's where we're going. So while we're here on earth, we're carrying that small seed of eternity around with us. And I thought that's pretty amazing because it's something I've never thought of. And our second point was repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed. And our second point, key point that 
now repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations. And Jesus is pretty clear about that message. We, that's our role here today as Christians to proclaim to others about repentance and forgiveness of sins. And when we accept Jesus as our Saviour, it's not a promise of wealth and happiness. It's also not a promise of good health or the perfect relationships. I loved your prayer about that. And it's not a promise that we can do whatever we want or believe whatever we want. No, what Jesus does promise is the forgiveness of sins in his name and he invites us to repent and believe this. And I'm praying today that each one of us have done that. It simply means that believing and but that by receiving this message and believing Jesus to be our Saviour and accepting his gift of forgiveness of our sins in his name, he requires us to turn from whatever it is that we are putting our hope in and turn to him. And when we do that, it changes us. How could it not? Our lives will never be the same when we let the risen Christ into it. When you believe that Jesus died for your sins and rose from the dead and is present in our lives, and he is right now, we're changed forever. And it also changes how we look at other things. Other things lose their importance because we are putting Christ first in <coughs> our lives. And so the third point is you are witnesses of these things. And when you have done this, Jesus has, when we've repented and forgiven and accepted him, he's got one more mission for us. And that was the last part of his instruction in this verse in Luke. And it's our third key point. You are called to be witnesses of these things. We're called to bear witness to the good news of the resurrection. You and I are called to go forth out into that lost, sad, lonely world and tell those people that are suffering so much out there who and what can change their life, how Jesus can come into their life, give them the hope and the love and the peace that so many people out there are looking for and can't find. The Olympic Games are being held in Paris from the 26th of July to the 11th of August and there's going to be over 10,500 athletes from 206 countries taking part. There's going to be 339 medal events with each event's winner receiving a gold medal, the second a silver and the third a bronze. So it's only going to be the best of the best who is going to win those medals. But there's going to be over 10,000 other athletes giving of their best, doing the best they can to prove what they can do in their sports. Baron Pierre de Coubertin expressed it in the Olympic Creed, and I just wanted to read that. The most important thing in the Olympic Games is not to win, but to take part. 
just as the most important thing in life is not the triumph, but the struggle. The essential thing is not to have conquered, but to have fought well. And we've all seen the Olympic flag with the five rings on it. And those five rings represent the inhabitant, the inhabited, sorry, continents of the world, Africa, the Americas, Asia, Europe, and Oceania. When we look at the gospel message today, it is going out to these five inhabited continents all around the world. We see the amazing internet, satellites, mobile services. Most people in the world seem to have a mobile phone. And God's message is going out through all of these things. So why am I talking about the Olympic Games, you're wondering? Because Jesus has asked each one of us to be witnesses of these things. We are his witnesses here on earth, on earth. And he wants us, wherever we are, whoever we meet, whoever we interact with, whoever we socialise, we need to say who Jesus is, how he is the Son of God who came to earth to live and die on a cross to save all mankind from their sins. But hallelujah, he defeated death and rose to life and is now at the right hand of God mediating for all mankind. Like the Olympic athletes, we all have a part and a role to play. God will and he has used mighty people. I think of Billy Graham, Martin Luther King, and so many other mighty men and women of God who have brought people to Christ. I can think of them as our gold medalists. But we, you and I, we're like those thousands of other athletes who strive to do the best they can and give of their best. And that's what Jesus wants us to do. Just be like them, to give and do the best we can as we witness for Jesus Christ. Do you wonder how we're going to do this? There's a perfect example. I'd like you to go home and it's listed on your newsletter to read Acts 3 verses 12 to 19 because there Peter gives a sermon. He and John had just healed a crippled beggar and the crowd is so surprised that Peter says to them, don't be surprised by this, for it is done in the name of Jesus. And then he says to them, you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. Now friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, but in this way God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets that his Messiah would suffer. Repent therefore and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out in those few short, sharp sentences. Peter gave that great sermon. Nothing fancy, just like the plain truth. He said to them, your sins, and it's yours and my sins, put Jesus on the cross, that God raised him from the dead. Repent therefore and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. And that's the whole core of our gospel. And that's why you and I are called to proclaim that message Sometimes it's not going to be easy, 
Sometimes it's going to be hard, but it's so important that we all do that. We weren't with the disciples on that first Easter evening. We weren't blessed to be witnesses to these things. We didn't see the risen Jesus. We didn't touch him. And we didn't have him to open our minds to the scriptures. But those first disciples shared what they learned. They opened the minds of others. And that's why you and I are here today, right now, because of the disciples and those early followers who went out and shared what they had learned from Jesus. So we are invited to go and bear witness to these things, to proclaim this message. And it's a simple, clear message. And I've put it on the notes that will be handed out after. And this is the simple, plain message that each one of us can and should be sharing. That Christ died for all, that Christ was raised again for all, and that Christ will come again for all. So simple, but so true. When I was preparing, I found this communal prayer, and I thought it would be nice if we did this this morning. So I'm going to say a line, and then I'd like you all to repeat it. So let's pray. Dear God, thank you for the disciples. Dear God, thank you for the disciples. Who shared everything. Who shared everything. They saw and learned from following Jesus. They saw and learned. Please help us to do the same. Please help us to do the same. Thank you. Amen. Amen. What a beautiful, simple prayer. But that's what we all need each and every day, don't we? So when the notes are handed out, please go home and put it up on your fridge and look at it every day at those, little, those three statements that Christ died for all, that Christ was raised again for all, and that Christ will come again. And we all say, Amen. Amen. So I thought, what more fitting song to sing than go forth in his name. Thanks. Yeah.
to be our benediction. That Christ died for all. That Christ was raised again for all. And he will come again for all. So please have a blessed week.